Well, good evening and uh, glad that you've tuned in to a Wednesday's Word. We pray everything's going well with you this week. Um, even if it's not, um, pray that uh, this Word will be an encouragement to you as you go through your week and all the challenges that go with living uh, in this world. But in Christ, we have the victory. So i uh, going to start a little two-part uh, little series for our Wednesday Word entitled An Artist Rendition of a believer. We're going to be looking at Ephesians 4, 17 through 32. Uh, that's 15 verses there. And, uh, you know, I'm always amazed when I said an artist rendition. You know, when when they have a witness, they look at, you know, when they go to talk to a witness and they bring that witness into the police station and, and then there's an artist that sits down with them and then they describe in detail the eyes and the nose and you know, mustache or not, and, and it's amazing how um, they're able to, that artist can take all that, and then the person look at, no, the, the nose is a little too wide, take off a little bit of the nose, and uh, no, their, their face not quite that wide, just narrow it down a little bit, and so they add to it, and take away from it, and put on to it, and and after they get through, the person's like, yep, that's that's the person I saw. I believe Paul gives us a picture, uh, an artist's rendition of what a believer looks like and uh, in this passage these 15 verses and I believe it's good reminders for all of us to say you know this is what I need to see in my life uh, as people would describe me and and give a police a, a witness of not me physically but me spiritually uh, in life so let's look at that before we do let's pray father in the name of Jesus Lord we pray that You'd speak to us through your word today and God take the words off the pages and Lord, may we just place them in our heart, Lord. And uh, Lord, we pray that uh, whatever speaks to us, Lord, in your word that we need to change and adjust and make differences, repent of, and uh, Lord, that we would hear you from you, Lord, and make those adjustments so we can be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so if you have your Bibles, Ephesians 4, verse 17 is, is where our world begin. And we're going to be looking at things like that artist does that'll take off the picture and things they'll put on the picture to make that picture uh, the portrait of a believer. So the first one I want to talk about is, is to take off worldly thinking. We've got to take off worldly thinking off our artist rendition of ourself uh, in, in verse 17, it says, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, what Paul's saying there is the Lord's in agreement with this, what I'm about to say, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. What he's telling them is, look, you know, you're saved. You know the Lord now. You know, you, you have to quit thinking the way you used to think. You used to think like the Gentiles think and how the Gentiles walked. And, and then he gives that description. They were uh, had futility of mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God. And uh, they did all this from ignorance. Uh, they didn't know. And now these believers know and they have to stop this worldly thinking. Uh, when it talked about the mind, just in these few passages, you got in verse 17, the word mind, in verse 23, the word mind, in verse 18, the word understanding, and the word eight, in verse 18, the word uh, ignorance, and later on in verse uh, 20, uh, we've got the word learned. So there's a lot that has to do with the mind. Yes, we commit our heart to the Lord, but you know, so as the man thinketh, the scripture says, so is he. Our thinking has to do so much. You know, you've heard the old saying, garbage in, garbage out. You know, the way we think determines our behavior. You know, if you look, you've heard the old saying too that says, we are what we eat. And you can make that statement, I guess, physically. And spiritually, you can kind of make the statement, we are what we think. And again, I said that verse, so as the man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Uh, Wrong thinking ends up with wrong actions. Wrong thinking ends up in bad behavior. 
And so we've got to think right. And he was saying, you know, those Gentiles, you know, they have futility in their mind. You know, there's a show called Criminal Minds. Um, you know, it's clear what that show's about, that criminals have a, a unique mind and these people study their behavior and they can figure out what they'll do and what they'll do next. And they can make a profile of them based on what they've seen in their mind. Matter of fact, you've probably watched shows before, or detective shows, and then you, that are true stories, reenactments, you say, man, what was that guy thinking? You know, he's gonna get caught. What's that guy thinking? You know, he, he can't get away with, with that crime. Well, criminals think, I believe, differently. It, that's, the, again, the show, Criminal Minds. They've been able to deduce that their thinking is different. Well, our thinking has to be different as believers. Our mind has to be the mind of Christ, the mind based on the word and not based on worldly thinking. You know, when we say worldly thinking, we mean that philosophy that's anti-God, that philosophy that doesn't line up with the word. And we have to look at it that way too. You know, and it says they're, they were darkened in their understanding. You know, they didn't understand what they need to understand. You know, we probably live in the most educated society ever. And even this country is so educated. People have more uh, opportunities to learn, but just cause you learn doesn't mean that, you know, you have understanding. Um, listen to Romans 12, one, for even though they knew God, <laughs> they knew God, they did not honor God as, as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. You know, because of their lack of understanding, they exchanged what was incorruptible for what was corruptible. You know, you take stuff back to Walmart or whatever, you can exchange it. You know, I want to exchange this shirt for this shirt. You know, I want to return this and get this. Well, they exchanged something. They exchanged something that was good and they exchanged it for something that was bad. What, what a rotten deal that is. But they did that from their lack of understanding. We've got to understand. The only way we can understand is have the mind of Christ, to have the word in us so that we can determine what's true and what's false, what's good and what's bad, and not based on our own understanding and, and, and not lead us to having the, our, our, our uh, understanding darkened. And so we've seen that. We've seen the church in general, not, not our church, but just what I'm saying is the movement in the church in general has, has become more worldly. That's how it'll be in the last days that the world's thinking is going to enter to the church. Let, let's do it this way, you know. Let's, let's operate this way. This is the way you get more people. This is the way you do it. Instead of, and I'm not saying you don't try to reach more people. What I'm trying to say is you can't lean on your own understanding. You can't allow worldly thinking and worldly ways to infiltrate into our minds, the minds of the church, the minds of uh, groups and ministries that we have to stay focused on that because one of the artist renditions is having no or taking away worldly thinking. Uh, the second thing I want to look at is <clears throat> taking away calloused hearts because the next verse that said why they're, they're in that situation, it's because in verse 18, because of the hardness of their heart, because of the hardness of their heart. Uh, Matter of fact, in verse 19, it, it says, and they having become callous. So a hard heart and they become callous. Um, I think that kind of goes together. You know, when, when, you, when you use your fingers or hands or anything that you use in great repetition, you know, like somebody that writes a lot, they'll get a callous usually on the inside of their, uh, one of their fingers. Uh, I don't play guitar, but I imagine that people that pay, play guitar a lot uh, will get calluses on their fingers. If you do anything in repetition, it develops a layer and then another layer and then another layer and then another layer of skin. And then eventually you don't feel as much as you would without that callus. And these people have, have not only developed calloused in their heart, they've allowed their heart to be hardened. And, 
you know, it take, we need a soft heart so the word of God will come in and richly dwell within us. You know, we can become hard hearted and we become that way because the callous gradually gets worse and worse to where we don't even realize we're moving toward a hard heart. And even that hard heart sometimes won't even confess it's got a hard heart because of deception. And so we can't, we've got to keep our hearts pure and not allow the callousness of those wrong thoughts to build in our mind and build in our mind to where it's part of our life. And then we do something we never should do is to get so callous we don't uh, feel it anymore. You've heard the illustration given several times, probably in the pulpit about branding a, a, a calf. You know, once they brand a calf the first time, it, it hollers and screams and, and has all kind of pain. And the next time they bring it in the next year to rebrand it, it, it hollers and moves less, the third time less, and maybe the fourth time it may not even move or have any pain at all because each time it calluses over to where the feelings aren't there. And we we can't let that do that because when the Holy Spirit tries to convict us and we're hard to it, that's that's a, a bad situation to be in. So we have to guard against that. The other thing we've got to take off is moral impurity. It said there, having become callous, having given themselves over to sensuality and the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Uh, it just led to impurity and greediness. We've got to make sure that's not part of our life. That's part of the world's philosophy. Uh, they, you know, they get, gave themselves over to that. These, and, and it, it was said that if the Ephesus, who the letter was written to, was one of the most wicked cities in that area. Matter of fact, some people that would comment about the morality in Ephesus was saying, you know, the morals were worse than animals. Uh, they just, the moral degradation is, was just extreme. And we, we have to watch the world influences us that way. What it, what it does, it, it, it deceives us. It's like when it gets worse and worse and worse and worse, then we can justify it or the, we try to justify it maybe. And the devil tries to get us to justify it by it got, it was at point one and that's at point two. And then uh, he can deceive believers to say, well, you're only at five. I mean, look at the world, it's 10, you know, as far as its morality going downhill. Uh, but we can't do that. We have to know that any sin, any compromise is gonna affect us. And we, we've gotta be, you know, morally, yes, we're saved by grace, but we walk in sanctification. You know, uh, in this book I bought uh, by Michael Medved, Hollywood versus America. Uh, he, he made this statement in there. He said, uh, he said, the power of the entertainment industry to influence our actions flows from its ability to redefine what constitutes normal behavior in society. Did you catch that? Even the entertainment industry was saying, we'll put it out there and the, and the devil can use that to say, here's what normal behavior looks like. And we receive that and say, well, that's how I should act. And, 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 and the influences of media, world, in all kinds of ways comes against us to take our morality and, and, and bring it to a point of where the world says what's normal and not what God says is normal. And that's where we end up people saying that the Bible's out of date and old fashioned. And then of course it said, and they do all that uh, with greed. And that, that's what, not, there's nothing wrong with money itself. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil, not money. And there were rich people in the Bible and poor people can be greedy. You know, we have to be content with what we have. Yes, we want to do better maybe or try harder or get a raise, a promotion. That's nothing wrong with that. But uh, the Bible talks about contentment. And so these people, uh, that mentality leads to greed as well. But that's not part of our portrait in Christ for the believer. And so we need to look at that. And then and, and in verse 20, it, it begins to say, uh, but you did not learn Christ in this way. We didn't learn Christ. And when it talks about learning Christ, it's if you really look at it in its original context, it really has to do with having to do with our salvation. Learning Christ was a, a, another way of saying your salvation. You learned Christ. You came to know Christ and you were saved. And so we don't, 
we don't uh, act that way anymore. We don't let that philosophy, it used to, uh, you know, but not after salvation. God and his word and his will dictates our thinking from then on. And then verse 21, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth in Jesus. Because we got to learn the truth now. The word is what dictates our thinking. The word takes over our, our thought processes. We let the word of God be our, our thinking and, and our, our, our mentality that way. And then verse 22, that in reference to your former matter of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance to the lust of deceit. You know, that, that old nature is just being corrupted more and more, but our spirit, the Holy Spirit that lives within us, that's being renewed and we're becoming more like Christ. Matter of fact, uh, Warren Wiersbe, uh, he calls it, uh, that he calls it saying, going from the grave clothes uh, to the grace clothes. Uh, we used to be in the dead in our sins, that was the grave clothes, and now we're in grace clothes living for Christ. A uh, great illustration of that is Lazarus. You know, uh, Lazarus died, and when he, the Lord Jesus uh, called him from the grave and he was alive again, remember he was bound in those grave clothes and Jesus said, loose him. So he was resurrected in a new life, but he had some grave clothes on him. And those, remember he told them, get, get them off of him. You know, he had to get rid of his gray, grave clothes so he can get some grace clothes and be free. And so that's the process of pulling all that stuff off, you know. And when he said loose him, he had some people there to help him loose him. You know, I think, you know, it's a great picture of the church. We're there to help one another, not in judgment, say, oh, you've got uh, grave clothes on. But we all have walked through that. We help each other, you know, uh, whether preachers or lift leaders or um women's leaders or women ministering to women and men ministering to men, helping each other as we walk through this life to become more like Christ. And so there's that, there's that freedom indeed that we have. Because And then verse 23, it says, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is the likeness of God. The likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. We've got this new mind we got this new thinking. We've got the spirit that's, that's waking up our mind and, and the new self, not our old self, but the new way of thinking uh, with Christ at the helm of our thought processes. Well, we're, that brings us up to where we're going to stop today. We'll pick this back up the next time we meet to, to look at that portrait of the, uh, of the believer and, and how that looks. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for these reminders, Lord, of what it means to be in Christ and how that looks and how that should look in our portrait. Lord, as we would ask somebody to draw a picture of us spiritually and let's see how it looks. And these are the things that would have to be taken away and the things that have to be put into our portrait. So, Lord, we thank you for your words, reminder to us all uh, to be more like you. And I just pray for each person the sound of my voice, Lord, whatever they're going through or walking through. Father, I just pray you'd give them the strength, the wisdom, the direction, the guidance, the encouragement they need to walk through the time they're walking through, Lord God, with your strength, your power, your mind, the mind of Christ to be their central focus in life and their guiding uh, light. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we're glad that you tuned in and uh, just wanted to close out with just one announcement. This Sunday is Mother's Day. Oh, great day in the Lord. I thank God for my mom. I know you thank God for your mom. Praise God that um, in his sovereignty, he gave us moms. And uh, so this Sunday, we're, we've got a special gift for each of our moms. We also have a photo booth that we'll be doing. Uh, at the spring campus, we're going to have, uh, I mean, at spring campus, uh, they'll be having a, uh, their photos will begin at 10 o'clock uh, if you want to come early and do the early takes. Uh, Magnolia campus will be starting ours at 830 for the early takes. 
Uh, for those that want to get, get theirs done before church, you can do that. If you didn't get a chance to sign up on Sunday, which we had a sign up sheet for early photos, then you can email the church at info at bfchurch.com and be able to uh, sign up that way. Or you can call the church at 281-350-9673 and tell them you want to uh, be on one of those slots for those early uh, pictures. Now, what we'll do is uh, when the service is over, uh, we'll dismiss our guest first uh, so that they can get in line uh, to get their family photos first. And then um, after that, then everybody else that wants to take their picture can get their picture done there. Uh, if you have your cell phone, we'll have a person there as well to snap a picture there with your cell phone as well as the photographer is going to take their pictures. And um, then you'll make your way th uh, through the line and we'll make sure all of our moms uh, get their uh, gift on their way out as well. So again, if you wanted to do early and, and not be in uh, wait afterward, and you do can do that, be sure to take advantage of those two things. Uh, invite mom to come. If uh, your mom's still living, I know she'd love to have you uh, with her at church and then also get that family picture as well. Uh, also invite her others to come you know people just say hey come on out to, uh, it's going to be a glorious time and it will be a glorious service in the lord and we look forward to it uh, being able to honor all of our moms and have a great time of worship word and fellowship together and it's always great to be in god's house so i hope to see you sunday and god bless you we'll see you then <music>